Hi, everyone. Welcome to our third quarterly AMA, Ask Many Things session. So as we conclude the third quarter and we're firmly in the last quarter of the year, uh, it's a good time to count the chicken uh, and see what uh, and take the stock of where we are and what, what, what we have done in the last quarter and what's yet to come up. Today, we have uh, all of our co-founders. Uh, so we have Kurt Nielsen. We have Peter Franson, we have Brian Gallagher, and we have a, a guest from uh, Orhus, Jesper Grovgard. Some of you may know him from the Dora Hacks Hackathon in July. We also have uh, Tiago, uh, Tiago Serodio from uh, who heads our community, and we have Bruce Ahn, who is uh, head of our developer relations. And as we start our AMA, please note that this AMA is being recorded, and the recording will be shared uh, towards the end of the week once um, all the recordings are done and once we process it. So without further ado, let's go to the agenda for this Q&A. Uh, AMA, sorry. So we'll start with Kurt. Kurt will talk about where we are with the project and all the activities and adoption um, and on-chain utility. And he will give uh, an update on our listing efforts, uh, followed by a presentation from our CTO, Peter Franson, about research code, internal controls, and the QA process. That uh, will be followed by a presentation from Jesper. He will talk about our main development status. And our um, AMA will be concluded uh, with the adoption status, so by Bruce, yours truly, and Brian. And uh, at the end, we'll have uh, time for Q&A. So without further ado, uh, over to you, Kurt. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, let's take the next slide and jump right into the, uh, can you hear me? It's, uh, yeah, it works. Perfect. All right, so so this is like the, the overall priority of the project as a whole. So top priority is governance and mainnet and then adoption. Uh, Governance is in place. AAA are audited for of the uh, of the uh, running of the project, the how how to run a, a foundation in out of Switzerland, and also the uh, the classification of the token, which is the two main uh, topic on that account. The the mainnet we are with the version four, and we'll be talking more much more about that. But it is on the three main features of the network: is uh, scalability, it's privacy, and interoperability. Talk more, a lot more about that, which is enabling all of the these new type of adoption. So with, with that in place, we can focus a lot, and the entire project is focusing on uh, adoption and uh, and also how to to bring that out, build platforms so people can come in and they can easily sort of tap into these opportunities uh, for for adoption. Then uh, listing is of course what we what uh, everyone has is thinking about. So we'll tap into that and uh, give you a state up to, to date. Uh, Status on that. So with that, let's take the the next uh, slide. And this is really the picture of the of the uh, of the main net with the three uh, main features. And, and this is basically what you know what you see on that uh, network is working on improving out there in the ecosystem. Uh, it's built in from from the very beginning, and we've been working on this for, from the very beginning of the project, and we are now on version four on all of these uh, different uh, main features. Scalability, uh, we have a, the way we do scalability is allow us to do unlimited parallel computer computation, which is very important in order for this to really scale. And uh, when it comes to privacy, it's the it's it's an unlimited uh, type of uh, privacy, so you can compute anything, which is called a joint complete uh, uh, computation. It's done in a in a regulatory framework such that you have the perfect balance between transparency about what you're doing private and then do the the privacy. And we also support uh, all the other types of uh, privacy preserving uh, computation protocols out there. Uh, so and and the interoperability is all about uh, increasing the security around moving at values and data around between independent ecosystem in the blockchain system. With that, let's dive into adoption. And I want to talk about two things on, on adoption, uh, two sort of platforms. So we could take the next slide. Uh, that the first one is on, on data. How we how we support the scalability of of using private data in the network. 
So the first step is the connecting to other uh, networks, connecting to other independent uh, blockchains out there. That's what we're doing with the BYOC bridges. The next step is to, to meet people where they are uh, with the wallets. And we are connecting with the MetaMask with 100 million users. And the next step is to, to use that to tap into or allow people to bring in their private data. So with that in place, you now have the full supply chain of people sitting there with their private data that goes into this network with that chip treat and compute on the private data and return results. So uh, that's kind of the taps into the basic value and basic vision for the for the for this uh, network. You can look at the MetaMask. The MetaMask Snaps is a a uh, new framework, it's allow you to compute on uh, or to, to it's a programmable uh, network that allows you to, to, to extend basically the use of, of MetaMask to, to whatever you can imagine. So it's, it's really a, amazing uh, a brick in this parcel. So let's take the next slide. Uh, so the next slide is sort of uh, just a revisit of the vision of the, of the project. So it is all about sort of using these technology to for, for privacy preserving computation to rethink basically how we think about data. So the 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 ownership to data doesn't really solve the problem in, in Web3. Because I don't I, the way you get value out of data is just by having having by looking at data, capturing the data. It's not the ownership that gives you the control. But if you cannot have privacy and, and ownership, then you are actually created turn data into something that is exchangeable. It's become something that I, as a user of the internet can control, and then I become part of the value chain. And that is what is creating the real value and the real uh, change in the, in the with the web tree. And you have the battlefield here too, to the right. So this allows us to go into all of these fields where you need sensitive information, banking, insurance, healthcare. And that's exactly what we do. So we. If we look at the next slide, this is some examples of uh, projects in that we are working with, project that is announced and project that is in the lead funnel and that we are working with. So from the from the left, we're having a sort of basic private data that is used for decentralized identification, which is a natural first step that goes into just that is a stepping stone to, to adding more uh, more uh, features. And we work with different projects out in this field from a, a national, national wide system uh, in Switzerland to Web3 applications. The next step is advertisement. This is kind of the main uh, value driver in the, in the internet economy. So there's a big potential here. If we can change the way you, you tap value out of this, uh, this uh, industry of advertisement, I mean, if you put the user into the uh, equation here and allow them to get paid or be, be, part, be part of the value chain when you use your own data as a data subject in this economy. The last part and, and advertisement is kind of a bit of a, of a data exchange uh, solution, but there's a lot of other data exchange solutions out there. And, and this is actually where we have the most projects. So data exchanges from advertisements to healthcare, to finance, to across industries. So, so there's a number of, of projects uh, or, or, or use cases that fit into this uh, framework of connecting the individual's data and put that through the system and get uh, values out of that. So that's the first scale up sort of platform and scale up with data. Let's look at the the next one, uh, next slide. So traditional, uh, the, the way to sort of bootstrap a, a new blockchain would be to look at DeFi and, and we have been doing that. Uh, so the, this is kind of how, how it goes. And we also have a, a full framework that is now ready uh, to, to utilize the scalability, which is done in a bit different way than, than other networks. Uh, which may at first look like a challenge, but it is actually an, a bit of an advantage if you if you do it right. 
The first step here is to, again, to connect to other uh, network, uh, build bridges, bring in assets, bring in values from, from other networks. Then the next one is to, to utilize the framework that I'm going to present in a, in a minute, where that really allows you to use the scalability in this network and the cross-chain uh, 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 DeFi functionalities that follows from this. And another part is to, to effectively address front running. This is where the privacy component comes in, uh, where you, you basically you basically keep the position hidden when you come into a, a Uniswap function. You you keep that uh, that uh, swap hidden from the rest of the uh, from the from the rest of the world basically until it is executed. And then there will be no way to to front run because you don't know what you're front running. The, the the next step, since we're building all of this stuff, we that is to our best uh, knowledge, uh, com more compliant to the traditional financial uh, approach. There is, I think we have a good opportunity here to, to bring these DeFi protocols to traditional finance. And that's that's what we are what we're working on. So let's have a look at the at the uh, the framework that we are building. Uh, which is on the next slide. So this is about a AMM, Automated Market Makers. Uh, it's a framework that you can read about in the block up here. You can read the scientific papers behind and you can look at the template contracts on, on these links. So what happens here is that if we look at the traditional AMM, uh, Uniswap on Ethereum, it's uh, it has to fit into that execution framework on Ethereum, which means that you have one users at the time, and then you do all or nothing. So so you go into that Uniswap shop and you trade maybe A to B in, on one pool, and then you go to another liquidity pool to trade B to C, and and maybe you'll even go back and trade back C to to A. Uh, that's an opportunity, and since you're the only one in the in that shop, you actually have the opportunity to make a profit on on free, uh, uh, free sorry uh, arbitrage in in a, in a, a network like that, depending on the prices. So what we are introducing is the the unlimited parallelization, which means that you have liquidity pools sitting on different shards, and these shards are completely independent, which is what is giving us the scalability. Uh, properties but it also sort of kind of destroys a bit of the of the free arbitrage as an example from, uh, that i just presented in the uh, traditional ethereum uh, framework so so what this uh, model that we are suggesting is actually to reintroduce that into a scalable framework so now we have a system that is maximizing the availability of all these assets that is sitting in, in this shop. So you can multiple users using the same Uniswap. And you have, if you have someone that is going to fix prices, then you only, only take out the liquidity for that swap that they are focusing on. So you're really maximizing the availability across these uh, liquidity pools in the system. There's a few details to this. So go dive in and, and read more about how this can be done. and. Uh, we have template contracts, so it's it's really uh, ready uh, to go. So let's so with that, I mean, uh, let's move on to to the next slide, and which is basically a picture of the of the total uh, ecosystem. And and uh, Bruce will give us an overview of what is sitting in in the lead funnel uh, further a bit later. So let's just move on to the to the next slide. So this is probably what most people are thinking about. So how, when do we get the MPC token listed? And we are working on that. And we are doing this in, in, in a time where you have uh, all of these headlines there. So this is a time where good is separated from, from, from bad. And we all know what is here on the, on the right side. A lot of, uh, lot of not so good news for, for the industry, let's put it that way. Uh, but on the other hand, you also have a lot of uh, interesting uh, news where as an example, in Japan, where there's a lot of interesting regulation happening at the moment, they're very positive around this, these, the, the technology and what it, what it brings to the economy. You have uh, uh, Hong Kong is looking differently at, at blockchain uh, again, and Brazil is very positive. You have something out of the UAE, 
and the EU is having the some unified regulation with the with the Mika uh, with the Mika bill uh, out of uh, EU. So so a lot of things is happening and uh, uh, good and bad. So so that's kind of the environment. Uh, so it's very dynamic when you when you're in there and 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 working with the with exchanges on on getting listed. So let's take the overview of what we're doing here. Next slide. So uh, uh, we are working on with multiple exchanges. It's going to be like a step-by-step -step, uh, listing across multiple venues. We are working with other partners around this, uh, and we're still aiming for 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 the end of the year, where to for 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 listing of the MPC token. Along the the way of doing that, we're also working on on and campaign, of course, to to uh, promote the listing. Uh, there will be airdrops. We're working with uh, the projects that is live on mainnet to how to help them uh, getting uh, getting bootstrapped on on the network. Uh, we are working with the MetaMask integration, the scale up by data that was presented just a few slides back, and and all of these uh, things that we we are we are aiming uh, with that we are focusing on is really going to put be put into to this. Uh, so adoption is of course what what we what is is driving the basic value and uh, we have uh, the first application coming out now uh, and uh, the framework is is ready and so on another thing that is important for for the for the listing is that we are we know the tokenomics we decided collectively that we froze or we paused the the uh, unlocking so we know exactly what is the number of tokens that is uh, available in the market uh, when we list, which is a uh, big advantage when you negotiate and uh, or when you bring uh, discuss this with uh, exchanges. Uh, so that's the state of the of the listing, and uh, yeah, let's let's move to the next slide. So on the on the topic of on chain. Uh, utility which is uh, what it's all about at the end we have these uh, two different uh, value chains sort of speak you have the fees for using the network the bring your own coin fees so when you you bring in through the bridges uh, maybe usdc you pay with that when you run transactions and that is floating down to the node operators the other the other part of the value is the rewards, which is a 10% of the total supply of the MPC token, which is used to bootstrap the, the network. And, and that we have a mechanism for how to distribute that to all of the token holders, basically, through operating the, the, uh, the nodes and through community staking or delegating delegate stakes to the node operators. So let's take the next slide. Uh, Yes, so so this is again the BYOC fee and the reward. Uh, so right now there is a split such that the node operators are getting all of the BYOC fees. Uh, the reward is giving 100% to the people that delegate tones. So what we are going to propose and what is in the channel is a small change to the way that reward is distributed such that the node operators, which is doing the job, that they get a, a small fraction uh, out of the rewards for for helping people uh, earning rewards uh, based on their tokens based on community staking. There is more details in, in the in the community channel, and maybe Bruce could touch on that and uh, or give us the the link in the show notes down there. All right, uh, on the next slide. Uh, I think maybe this was the last one. No, the last slide is this one. So it's just to 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 emphasize and remind everyone that we are now in in terms of reward. We are in, in Q6. So we see that more and more tokens is put into uh, community staking. So in this quarter, there is a uh, two million something uh, tokens available for 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 everyone who delegate or stakes stakes in the system. So. That's just a uh, how, yeah. That's how it is. It's fixed, and that's uh, how it's going to be. And you can log into these, uh, click on these links, and, and see what what is uh, what the what the numbers are for the future uh, uh, quarters, and also what has been distributed in the previous quarters. So with that, I think I'm done. If I remember this slide, Dave. Thank you, Kurt. 
<laughs> Thank you, Kurt. Uh, I know a, a lot of you have some questions, so if you can keep them until the end and we'll answer them in due course. Um, and now we go to Peter Franson. Yes, thank you. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Uh, so this, this, well, this is about how the way that we develop software. So uh, basically, I've uh, added Jesper to Aftermind because, as our VP of Engineering, he has much more interesting stories to tell. But I want to tell the overall framework for actually working with quality when we deliver software and when we are building software. But before I, uh, so maybe slide. Before I go into that. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Next one, please. Uh, before I go into that, I really want to touch upon something very crucial for the things that we're doing. So the things that we're doing is actually advanced cryptographic protocols. We're building something that is not currently in use anywhere else. So, and I've taken these three cryptographic, cryptographic protocols. Of course, there's more. There's a lot of things that is fairly similar to what other blockchains are doing, but what we are doing has some unique components. So I, I'd like to uh, highlight these three things. And they're based on solid academic work. And as you can see, these years are ancient. So, so the original ideas is actually not new. However, the composition of it and the utilization of it and the entire consolidation of it is actually fairly new. So taking fast track, which is the consensus protocol. That's the consensus protocol that allows us uh, speed of light finalization. We don't have, as other blockchains, we don't have block times per se. We produce blocks when need be. So we don't, uh, our block producers are not sitting around. They're not uh, waiting for, for the next time slot to occur. They see a transaction and then they produce a block. And once they've seen a transaction in a block, then they think, oh, we need to finalize it. And then they produce another block. So it, that's why they, I say it's speed of light finalization, because it's actually the speed of light. It's first time that uh, this protocol in in what ended up being our fast track protocol was appeared was actually in 2005 when our chief scientific scientific officer has his dissertation uh, with his protocol with that protocol in it it ended up being uh, included as a primary component to the book about distributed component uh, distributed systems in uh, computer science so Jesper literally wrote the book on blockchains for uh, university of Oz and included the fast track protocol. And that's the 2018 protocol. And it was written as we built it. So uh, it, 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 it went hand in hand. This where first we, uh, first yes, but defined a bit, then we implement them. Yes, but defined tomorrow and then we implement it. And that all that happened in 2018 and has been consolidated uh, ever since. Taking our real protocol, the uh, MPC protocol, is based on, well, the raw idea is based on the Shamir sharing. And uh, the first time it appeared in an academic paper was in 1997. The current one with the, uh, uh, the current one with the somewhat more advanced pre-processing and the, the ability to separate the pre-processing into uh, an online, uh, separate the pre-processing from the online phase and doing it in, uh, with the hyperinvertible matrices was actually coined first time in 2007. And uh, then we added, of course, uh, time. Uh, we, we work actually in a bleeding edge uh, software development environment. So the academic protocols is running really, really fast. And a lot of work has happened since 2007. And that's why we are currently in the process of consolidating the description of the real protocol right now into a formalized academic paper. So a lot of these things, uh, each idea has been vetted before but we haven't had a consolidated academic uh, description of it so far. And lastly, the large oracle, which is the component that is powering, well, powering every part of our interoperability. So the large oracle is the component that serves as a um, mirror of the consensus protocol. So it is actually a signature mechanisms built into the consensus protocol. The, there is a consensus protocol in the, uh, con uh, there is a signature protocol in the consensus, but it's somewhat too expensive uh, compared to this very efficient protocol. And this efficient protocol allows us to do very fast and efficient uh, verifications on say Ethereum. And as you can see, this is also something that has uh, large, uh, many years uh, in working. And the, the current one that we're working on uh, is uh, was first described in 2018, and has been consolidated in 2022 because that's the one that we ended up implementing. However, the large Oracle version two 
which is going to be a successor of the current large Oracle is actually still in process. So we are basing all our major cryptographic work on the scientific proven protocols. So we want to have our protocols seen, proven and vetted by the scientific community before we start implementing it. So what happens when we start implementing? Uh, uh, when, when we start implementing uh, the code, which is on the next slide, uh, you can see that the, the problem is that code is king. Uh, in blockchain, code is everything. But then we let humans change it. So humans are error prone, code is not. Well, uh, at least the code reacts always, uh, should act always deterministically. So what, what, how are we controlling the process of developing software? How are we uh, tracking it? And uh, the way that we are tracking is that each issue has each change has an issue. So we don't change the code unless we know why we're changing it. It's important for us to make sure that the code is changed based on some external requirement. We are not changing just to change. We change it because we want to achieve a goal. And uh, the roadmap is the best example of a planned way of changing the code because we haven't put it into the roadmap. We always, we never ever work alone. You, you cannot push anything uh, to uh, the main branch without having it reviewed by someone else. So someone needs to check the code that you are uh, delivering to the project. So there's always two pairs of eyes uh, involved. And and actually, it, it turns out that uh, we also, uh, for uh, monetary uh, or asset controlling code, we even add a third, we have a third uh, uh, fixed uh, or uh, on uh, a auditor that is uh, on a retainer. So we have uh, someone auditing all our code that controls assets each and every time we change it. And then even on the top of that, we're also doing external audits by external agencies. Uh, I want to stress, so, so I put in here the link for our guidelines, our developer handbook. So you can see which developer, how our developer handbook is written and, and what are the framework for delivering software. So you, you'll I'll be happy to, to show that that's publicly available. I just want to stress that we actually, for especially for our backend, we have 11 specific code analysis tools that actually check that we have provided the code in the right quality or in the best quality possible. And that uh, code quality is 100% code coverage and mutation test coverage needs also to be 100%, which turns out to be very, very hard to achieve if you haven't tried it before. So there's, we are trying our best to actually make sure that the code that we're shipping is doing as intended by the uh, original proposal. Uh, if you change the slide, I'll just go through the uh, quality assurance fund, which can be seen as a fund. Uh, let me see if I can do this right. Uh, it can be seen as a funnel where in the beginning we start with the design. So in the we start having design and the design uh, needs to be reviewed by the principles, by the one that are going to accept the code in the end, the, to, that design needs to be reviewed by them. Then we actually start delivering the software. So this is where most flaws are being caught. And then we start to delivering the code. Uh, when we write the code, we find we use our automated tools and we have a ton of tests and I can't even begin to count the number of times that uh, people have changed the code because it was not tested properly or because the mutation coverage was not high enough. Then, then comes the code audit, uh, code review. And this is again, one of the places where really have a, uh, where a lot of things is being caught. And then the external audit for monetary code that now we are getting to a point where the fund becomes much tighter where we have fewer problems being found, the third party auditor uh, then checks the code. And last, uh, lastly, we go to the integration phase, we put it into our comprehensive tests, where we, each time we change the code, we have comprehensive integration tests that test that the code in uh, real life uh, actually works as intended. And once that has been completed, then we move the code to, uh, to open source. And once it's been moved op into open source, we can release the test native mainnet images, and very few uh, times we actually had to change the software based on something that was found uh, in the test. Net. So this, this is sort of the fun in which we are running our uh, quality assurance and uh, the, the way that we secure the software that has been delivered. And with that, I'll hand it over to Jesper, our VP of engineering, who will be telling us uh, not how, but actually what we've shipped. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, I'll try to take you through all the different things that we have shipped and the I'll give you some highlights about what's coming uh, in the roadmap for the next uh, little while. 
So, Bakit, if you take us to the next slide, then I'll start with the highlights here. Uh, some of the one of the really big things uh, that Kurt, Kurt already touched upon is uh, MetaMask. Uh, we we did the integration with MetaMask Snap, and uh, now it's actually possible to use MetaMask for signing transactions that you're sending to uh, the Partici blockchain. This was uh, a really great effort for us to do, and it opens a lot of doors for uh, other possibilities of using MetaMask because right now we can use it for signing the transactions. But as Kurt said, MetaMask is actually Snap is an open framework where we can kind of put in more interesting content and we can make sure that this MetaMask integration really uh, shines and offers a lot of the unique uh, value propositions that Partition Blockchain has. So we will be working on that uh, from here on. A second the delivery that we've made is, is the newest version of the browser, which is now very close to feature complete. You have seen the MPC Explorer, which, which was our kind of first offer in this space. And now we are, have made the browser as a, as a new generation of uh, Explorer. And the browser now offers insight into blocks, transactions, accounts, contracts, uh, but does so in a uniquely user-friendly way that really highlights the value of the Partici blockchain. So if you haven't uh, already used it and looked into it, I, I really recommend you to have a look at it and, and see what it can do. I believe the browser is going to be a, a really big step in the adoption effort as well, because it's really good for both developers and for users who are using uh, deep apps that are running on Partitia. Finally, I'm uh, glad to announce that the, the, the long time that we've been working on getting the KYC solution up and running uh, is now at an end. So we have the solution developed. Uh, the final testing uh, is happening just as we speak and, and uh, the documentation has been deployed. We have simplified how you register your node. So now anyone who's been waiting for the KYC should be able to actually become a node operator. Uh, we will be sharing the announcement uh, with you very soon on where to go and how to get started. So I think those were the three uh, biggest announcements here. If you take the next slide packet, I'll also try to walk through some of the other stuff from the roadmap that we have delivered. So we have uh, separated out all the contracts that we have that uh, revolve around DeFi. And uh, they have been released in a, in a specific DeFi uh, repository, and they should be ready for anyone who wants to do DeFi on Partitia to take and deploy and run your, your own versions of these, these contracts. So this is the token contract that is for native tokens on Partitia. It is an NFT contract if you want to do NFTs. There is a swap or an AMM that is based on Uniswap. Uh, that is ready to be deployed for uh, swapping to uh, a pair of tokens. And there is a DEX factory that can keep track of a bunch of swaps and deploy new swaps. Finally, as Kurt alluded to, we've been working on this scalable AMM uh, solution where, the, where we can do full scalability of a routing of swaps where the different swaps are sitting on different shards on the blockchain. And uh, we will be releasing not only the, the swap contracts that can participate in this, but also the routing contract that, that will actually help you move your token through a number of uh, different currencies to get to wherever you want your token to go. So that is what's coming up in the DeFi world. As Peter said, all of these contracts have been uh, gone through our rigorous review and testing process. On top of that, we have uh, released some CK contract examples. Uh, the secret voting and the second price auction is available for you. And more will be coming up, uh, I think, on one of the next slides. So I'll, I'll share a few of the examples that are coming with you. And the BYOC framework uh, has been finished. The framework is what allows anyone to actually uh, Anyone who's a node operator, a token holder who has enough tokens to actually propose a new BYOC currency, which can then be 
voted through uh, by the node operators and which will then become a BYOC token on the blockchain. The first two tokens we will be that will be running through this framework will be the, the Polygon Matic token and the USDT token. Uh, but uh, after that, it will be possible for anyone who has enough tokens themselves to propose another new token to go through the framework. Okay, next slide. Yes. Finally, a few more smaller updates. Uh, we've delivered a bunch of governance stuff. Uh, for instance, price oracles that allows you to keep track of the price of Ethereum and the BNB uh, token. We have uh, delivered what's called staking as insurance, meaning that if you have a smart contract that you want to make in really sure is not delivered because it lacks gas for paying uh, for storage, then you can actually stake MPC tokens towards that contract, which will uh, guarantee that it stays alive. And finally, we've released a feature that allows you to initiate the rotation of the BYOC oracles. We are also releasing the uh, how do you actually run Partitia blockchain as a MPC or zero knowledge uh, second layer on top of Ethereum. Uh, we already did version one of that and version two is coming out uh, in the coming weeks. So if you want to do second layering on top of Ethereum, then uh, we'll have some really great examples uh, showing you how to do that. And in the smart contract ecosystem, uh, where we are helping developers create solutions. We've released new documentation, new guides, a test framework that allows you to thoroughly test your own contracts. So you can use the same type of the methodology that we're using for testing the governance when you develop your own contracts. We've released a command line interface that allows you to interact with Patricia blockchain from your command lines to automate uh, interaction through scripts. And we released a bunch of examples. Uh, how do you code a client? What does a web page that talks to Patricia look like? And uh, a bunch of smart contracts. So that's a lot of the stuff that's already out there. Let me tell you a little bit of what's, about what's coming in the, in the next months. So on the governance side, we want to improve the way we select the block producers. We are going to put a little more randomization in to actually make the block production, uh, be uh, the block producer selection better. Finally, uh, we are going to be adding even more comprehensive integration testing, especially around how the account uh, balances uh, work and move around through the different types of operations. Regarding adoption, what we want to do is to add some features to the smart contract uh, language and the abilities you have as a D app developer. So we want to support really huge states in your smart contracts. This will, for instance, allow you to create a smart contract that has 1 million token holders uh, of your own native token. Another thing we're working on will is the cheaper deployment of smart contracts so that you can deploy a lot of contracts without paying so much gas. And a big one that we'll be adding is contract upgradability, which will allow you to deploy new versions of code for contracts that already uh, have been deployed. The upgradability will have a governance that can be designed by the smart contract programmer. So whoever codes the contract can decide who and how the, uh, the code is allowed to be upgraded. Regarding the developer experience, we will be launching a web IDE that will make it really quick for developers to get in and develop their own uh, solutions. We'll be launching a gas estimation tool. And finally, we want to give even more examples. For instance, an example of how to do statistics uh, in zero knowledge and an example of how to get random data. So those were some of the highlights of uh, what's to come. I think we move. Thank you, Jasper. That was our VP for engineering out of Orhus. Now we move to adoption. So and we will start with Bruce Ahn, head of our developer relations. Hey, thanks, Vicky, and thanks everybody for joining on this call. Um, yeah, if we can go to the next slide, we'll just begin talking about uh, adoption. Yeah, so 
So uh, the first number that I hope that the audience, that you guys will be able to see is a significant increase in the number of leads that we're working with since the last AMA. Three months ago, we were working uh, for the first six months of the year, we were working with 43 leads in the enterprise, about 43, 45 leads in the Web3 space. In the span of uh, three months, we've you know tripled the number of leads that we, we had. Um, and that was, um, it, it was a surprise even, even to myself, I think even to the team, you know, how we were able to get so many leads all of a sudden. I think uh, we could distill it down to like five specific reasons. Um, so the first one I, I think is that uh, privacy is becoming a focus in the industry. If you go into different events, you'll see that people are talking about uh, zero knowledge proof and people are actually recognizing and understanding what MPC is. Uh, so privacy has become a very big focus, and we think that it's going to continue uh, to be to, to be shown interest. Uh, the second reason is that we're we're far more active in events. You guys have seen, uh, hopefully, uh, us attending events, uh, doing reports, uh, showing what the what the events have you know uh, has 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 given us after we attend them, and then we would write reports um, from from what we've what we've gathered from those events. So we're definitely more active in events. Uh, the third reason is that our adoption team is growing. Uh, you've seen some articles, hopefully if you're astute and, and keeping up to date with all the different articles that we've been writing, you might've seen uh, two new faces, uh, which we'll formally announce in, in the near future. Uh, but our adoption team is growing and they're, they're, they're adding a tremendous amount of value. Uh, they're bringing in leads uh, from the enterprise space, from the Web3 space, um, and they've been actively pursuing and closing leads as well. And so, so that's another uh, reason why our leads has exploded. Uh, the fourth reason is that our external leads team is also producing a lot of results. So as an example, you guys may have heard of uh, Vinny, Vinny Lau, um, and he's been helping us generate additional leads and, and being you know, adding a tremendous amount of value uh, in the ecosystem as well. And lastly, the fifth reason, uh, and this is actually to answer a question that came up on our live question, uh, which was, uh, you know, why hasn't anybody heard of us yet, right? Uh, people have heard of us. So I, I was in Token 2040, as an example, I was in Token 2049 and I was in this MPC conference and the person on the stage was giving you know, a demo and then he had a Q and A and one of the person you know, in the audience in, in front of me has, you know, raised a hand and said, oh, so, so you guys are doing this from a scalability perspective. How does it compare to Partesia blockchains pre-processing method? And I was like, who, who, who was that? Who, who was that that's, that mentioned our name? You know, uh, so so it was really exciting to 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 hear uh, people mention our name. So when we go to events, we say, "Hey, I'm from Partija Blockchain." Many people are saying, "Hey, I heard of you guys." Hey, I, oh yeah, I've heard of you guys. So I think at a high level, it shows that you know our marketing, while it may seem uh, quiet uh, to you guys, uh, that it, it is seeing results. And I think Pakit will, will share a little bit more detail around that. So those are the reasons why I think we're seeing a lot of leads and we think that it's going to continue. And as a result of that, we are signing new projects. Uh, so as an example, Veric, uh, we announced Veric, we announced uh, Verifier, we announced Del Norte, uh, all working on different aspects of the, uh, the project focuses that Kurt has mentioned earlier in in, in the previous slides. Um, and so, so new projects are being signed with more to come uh, and hopefully we'll be able to continue to show progress in, in our growth and, and the increase of our, of our dApps in our ecosystem. And the other exciting news is that uh, mainnet launch is coming up for a variety of different teams that have been building uh, quietly for a while. So as an example of blockchain ads, uh, meta names, Varric, uh, you will soon see launch dates uh, coming up soon. And as a result, uh, for the node operators, uh, hopefully you'll be you'll begin to see BYOC results flowing through, uh, helping to, uh, to to show value uh, to, to, to those people who are running the nodes. So that's our high level uh, leads and adoption, uh, leads update. 
from a project focus looking forward. Uh, so we have a couple of different project focuses. Uh, Kurt mentioned uh, two different types of scale scaling from, a, from an adoption perspective, scaling with DeFi and scaling with data. So from scaling with DeFi perspective, uh, there are teams that have shown a lot of interest in building uh, wallets for us. In fact, we had a uh, a, a team that wanted to build wallets for us for free um, and, and wanted to include not just our tokens, but also to be able to integrate the additional value proposition that we add on top of just you know, providing tokens. So things like uh, DID, uh, things like SSI, or things like, uh, so scaling with data as an example, to be able to do advertisement directly from a wallet or integrating the wallet into, into an advertisement platform or a Web3 cookie tracking perspective. Uh, so there's a lot of wallet interests. Uh, we have teams that are interested in uh, building a bridge with us from a UI perspective. So it, as, an, as a reminder to you guys, we have an infrastructure already that uh, we can promote that we promote as the, the the world's most secure bridge in the world. It's powered by MPC, so we have this amazing infrastructure, and now people are interested in building bridge uh, to to uh, to a bridge UI on top of the existing infrastructure that we have to promote the world's. Uh, most secure bridge. And then once the bridge is solid, and then there are now teams that are interested in building the DeFi side of things, uh, going back to Kurt's, uh, the scalable AMM uh, model. So we have a solid pipeline of teams that are looking to build on the DeFi track. And then we have scaling with the data side. We also have a very uh, a solid pipeline with with DAOs that are are interested in adding privacy. If you if you guys remember um, on the ETH Milan, I was in a panel where we talked about DAOs and we talked about the importance of adding the human element into DAOs, which included the need for privacy to create a more uh, integrity based uh, voting structure. So DAOs have shown a lot of interest. Uh, supply chains also have shown a lot of interest. Uh, in fact, we met with uh, two different um, well-established supply chain companies at uh, uh, the CV summit that we had, um, and they were also interested in our technology. So we're gonna continue to pursue those leads as well. Um, and then we also have the DID, um, data sharing and analysis, those types of things. Uh, DID has been a very big focus. You know, every single conference you hear of at least three or four different DID solution providers, and, and we add additional functionality through MPC. So they're interested in learning about how they can add additional offerings on top of their existing DID solutions, as well as uh, data sharing and analysis. Uh, so things like um, supply chain would be a, a data sharing and analysis. Uh, things like advertisements uh, would be data sharing and analysis. So those are another uh, a track that we're focused on, and a lot of uh, teams are showing interest in building on our chains with those with those topics. And lastly, there is the others section, which which goes outside of our of our MPC technology, it would be very interesting to, to for you guys to know that you know gaming teams have shown interest as a result of our interoperability model. Um, so, so the interoper interoperability model was really created initially to to allow for other tokens to be to be used in our in our system as a way to promote interoper you know the, 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 in a way for us to promote the collaboration um, between other chains. But gaming teams have shown interest and they're saying, hey, I, I want to be able to open up our gaming platform outside of the infrastructure that I've built on. Rather than if I built a game on top of Ethereum, only the ETH people can, can jump in and pay and then and play in, in, our, in our games. What we want to do is to add other you know, gaming customers, people we want to allow for payment for Ethereum, BNB, uh, you know, USDC, USDT, Polygon, et cetera, et cetera. And so our platform, if you build a game on our system, it allows for that. So there's a lot of interest from a gaming perspective, uh, NFT as a certificate, uh, NFT as art, um, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of interest from the other 
aspect of things uh, outside of the multi-party computation. So that was very interesting to see. And lastly, uh, as Jesper mentioned, we are moving forward with BYOC. And as a result of us onboarding USDT and MATIC uh, tokens by the by the early November, uh, we're looking to we're looking to onboard more uh, teams that are interested in using that interoperability, as, as I mentioned from a gaming perspective. And, and lastly, I'll just end with the fact that we are looking for more tokens to be onboarded, maybe you know, WBTC as an example, or maybe Shiba, who knows? Um, and we're counting on you guys. We're counting on you guys to be able to, to think about which tokens you wanna see on our chain, which tokens you think will add value into our chain and, and become participants um, in our chain, right? We don't just wanna build something we want. We wanna be able to work with you guys and, and, and collaborate with, with you guys to, to create this wonderful infrastructure uh, that we're creating. So, uh, so Bakit, that's that's my uh, leads and adoptions update, and I will hand it back over to you. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you, Bruce. And yes, and we're always counting on you on your ideas and on what tokens do you think should be next uh, in our BOIC framework. So with that, um, I'll give you some updates. From my end, um, as Bruce mentioned, we've been more active at various events. And um, uh, so, this time around, we are focusing on multi-region strategies. So we're in Asia, within Asia, uh, we had a speaking slot at Korea Blockchain Week in Seoul. So Bruce, who's also a native of Korea, did, uh, did uh, honors there and uh, held a beautiful speech there. Um, you might have, and if you want to know more, please go to our medium and you will read, uh, you will read what exactly happened. there. And then moving on to Singapore, we had uh, our co-founder Brian Gallagher and uh, Bruce Ahn were on the ground, uh, which generated a few interesting leads. We co-sponsored an event there and uh, Brian delivered a speech, uh, which of which recording is on our channels as well. And uh, last week, uh, most of our team uh, were in City Summit in Souk, our, in Switzerland. We were one of the sponsors and we had a booth so that was a B2B event, which obviously was a different kind of event. It wasn't open for the masses, but we did have uh, key constructive uh, dialogues there with uh, our existing uh, partners and uh, potential future uh, partners as well. And ETH Milan, um, also last week, uh, Bruce uh, on the panel and spoke about uh, the NPC technology and uh, DK proofs. So what's, uh, this week, there will be, uh, you'll hear an uh, announcement from us. Uh, we, uh, as Bruce mentioned, our team is growing, and one of our new team members, about whom you will hear later this week, will uh, is on on the way to Bahamas and will be on two panel spots, um, uh, and uh, you will hear more details about that. Uh, obviously, what's coming for the rest of the uh, of the year, uh, we have... Um, online hackathon planned for you. And we have a few interesting programs um, planned. So Dev Bounty and development growth programs and those will be announced in due course. And that uh, those will be, uh, those will generate a lot of interest from especially from the development community. And uh, uh, Bruce mentioned marketing and uh, being noticed um, what we've done in the last quarter. So we've onboarded an external agency to help us uh, with, uh, with with reach uh, where we can't reach, they help us out. So, and as a result, for example, our uh, MetaMask Snaps announcement um, actually had almost 78 million reach. Uh, there was at least 20 articles that I counted. Uh, they were in English and Spanish and a few other languages. This is just uh, one recent example. And uh, with, uh, also our TI with the Rodeo, who most of you know, has been uh, regularly commenting and providing is uh, inside the Coin Telegraph in various languages, and we've been featured in Dense Decentralized and so the Tech News. These are just a few examples, but in general, if uh, in the last quarter um, we have seen an eighty-one percent increase in uh, press mentions compared to the previous quarter, and which uh, resulted in a three hundred twenty-three percent increase in audience reach, and um, or even um, and then. Our, even our monthly, um, even our YouTube views have increased on uh, 56, 57% on a monthly basis. 
what um if we look back at the last quarter what we've done and uh, this goes back to uh, what Kurt and uh, Bruce mentioned about um, uh, projects that are building uh, on our chain. So we've met, we've featured uh, eight of them as part of an ecosystem focus campaign with more to come. And for example, uh, you might have heard of blockchain ads, for example. So we mentioned, so they were part of the focus program and we will continue our ecosystem focus campaign as well. We've announced uh, our grants program for the second half of 2023. Uh, please apply. Uh, and we also had a solution spotlight campaign in the last quarter. We feature, uh, we've highlighted 10 of our uh, solutions. And what is yet to be planned, uh, what we're planning for the uh, for this quarter is we will, we will do an industry specific solution campaign where we will highlight our solutions tailored for various industries and what problems they will solve and what value will they add to those um, industries. And as most of you have seen, we've uh, launched our um, video series, uh, Partija Pulse, and we started the first debut edition was in, in July, and we'll keep it up. And, and most of you said that uh, you really enjoyed the format. We'll do more of that. And um, so that was a quick wrap up for me for Q3. And with that, I hand over to Ryan Gallagher. Thanks, Pakit. Hey, everybody. Um, so, of course, we're building a robust infrastructure where all sorts of use cases can be built on top. Uh, one of our focus uh, dApps, though, is sort of targeting more the social side of blockchain, as well as gaming, NFTs. Uh, so it's a bit of uh, an exciting consumer play on top of Partija blockchain, and it's called party.com, P-A-R-T-I.com. Um, we've had a really successful beta launch these last few months. Um, so here we just posted the numbers from July to September. Uh, during that 90-day stretch, we achieved 155,000 active users. Those are each unique individuals who came to the website to watch live streams, you know, chat, comment, etc. Um, basically, what we've managed to achieve, and as you see there also, we say that we've gotten 517 streamers to join. So it's a two-sided marketplace. There's content creators, live streamers, and then of course, viewers. So we already have over 500 people who've done a live stream. Um, and this has been a very effective way to gain site traffic and users because Streamers are popular now. The trend of most media, live media, is going towards live streaming. Um, and basically, the strategy is that you know we've integrated a um, typical Web2 login, but combined it with some new technology to issue Web3 Partija wallets with each new user sign up. So as we're accumulating more users, we're actually accumulating more wallets on the blockchain. And so part of the strategy over the next few months is to activate these wallets with things like airdrops, you know, on platform insight, games, currency, et cetera. Um, longer run, facilitating micro awards for data exchange, like receipts, surveys, and then already working anytime there's a subscription to a creator, or you purchase one of their NFTs, that's all on chain, driving real world transactions onto Bartesia. So... Um, actually, this live stream even was supposed to be on party, but Tiago's uh, computer broke right before the live stream. So we had to make the pivot back to Zoom. So you can look forward to maybe the next AMA and, uh, you know, weekly Bartesia Hive Minds uh, being on, on party uh, if you haven't experienced it yet. Um, but yeah, that's it in a nutshell. Um, you know, I think the the Partija blockchain solving, you know, three major uh, problems like Kurt started off his talk with, which is scalability, you know, interoperability and privacy. And, you know, in a site like this, it's a very good demonstration of sort of web two meets web three, where, you know, the scalability of our blockchain allows things like high volume micro rewards for transactions or subscriptions. You know, if you try to do all that on Ethereum, it would just be unaffordable. If you want to send someone 25 cents, it would cost you a dollar and 50 cents, right? To send USDC across Ethereum. So the scalable nature of our blockchain allows for new age platforms like this to exist. The interoperability allows for multi-network currency usage across the, the platform. 
Uh, it's not just, you know, you're only able to, you know, move things around on ETH, right? So um, this is the trend of how dApps are going to be uh, that, you know, accommodate all the different networks and, you know, give micro reward opportunities and things that are privacy preserving like ad targeting. That's sort of in the future of where we see, uh, you know, social networks and user interactions heading. And so I think Partija blockchain is on a great start to providing the proper infrastructure that would allow an app like this to function. Uh, so please give it a try and see what that is all about. Uh, and that's it for me. All right. Uh, thank you, Brian. And this concludes presentation from our end. And now it's time for a question. I think some questions have been already answered. And we're also actually past one minute past the hour, but uh, I will go ahead and and and, and ask a question um, from um, uh, Kurt, Peter, Brian. If you were to give us one teaser, right? What things that you haven't mentioned in Q four? What do we have? What do? Uh, what does our community have to look forward to? Give us a teaser. What is yet to come? There's a few that come to mind, but if I said them, I would get in trouble. So <laughs> I can't say that. <laughs> that's the thing. That is a number of things, but uh, I mean, we cannot uh, speak about everything. So that's really a lot of things happening. But I, I mean, personally, I, I think this whole uh, thing about the meter mask snap and the uh, abilities to, to, so someone is just building that uh, programmable wallet that just fits so perfectly into what we're doing. I mean, I can't wait to see what we can get out of this. Uh, I was really amazed to, to see this uh, perfect fit to what we're doing. And just to think that more than 100 million users, right? And they'll have access to, you know, they can use our technology. So that's a big number. I still need to get wrap my head around it, but that's something that I think a lot of people I can be excited about and um, go play with it. Um, Peter, any teaser well, from Ted, your end? Ted kind of stole my thunder. So he said what I was about to say. So that's uh, really cheating. No, no. I uh, So so there are a number of different aspects of the things that are coming. But I am, uh, how do you put it, a cautious type of person. So I, I, I'm i not going to announce anything on this. I actually know it's shippable because uh, I know that devil lies in the detail. And when it comes to software, yeah. you need to make sure that it, it is uh, there's not a flaw. And to, to, to go back into history, one of the points about the, one of the novelties in the bring on coin framework that we have or bring on coin system that we have has actually, was actually coined back in the day. So we had a design and then um, it was, uh, there, there was a question being raised about it. And one and a half year later, we actually had the current design because it turned out that while the naive way of doing it is fairly easy to implement, the right way of doing it actually requires us to have both the small and the large organ, to have collateral on the small organ and use the entire value chain or uh, value of the chain in the large organ. And, and those two goes well, very well hand in hand and is actually necessary to achieve the type of things that we're doing. So I wouldn't underestimate understanding the right design. Um, and that means that also a number of the things that I really want to brag about is going to be postponed. So sorry about that. I've answered uh, at least one of the questions in the, uh, we do have more stuff to come, yeah, but I this see. is again, one of the things that I'd rather pre prefer to state when it's done and not when I'm hoping it's going to be done. So, so we have one question, which uh, was already answered, but in regards, I'll still read it out. So I think Kurt, it's uh, what you mentioned earlier. The question is, are we entering the exchange this year? Yeah, exactly. That was in, in one of the slides. Uh, we'll share the uh, the video and, and probably also the slides after the uh, after this. So uh, yes, it's still uh, we're still aiming for for the end of this year with with listing with, with multiple uh, exchanges, venues, step by step listing, and a lot of campaigns. Uh, we spoke about a number of things that where we are tapping into the what we're doing with the auction and and working uh, creative with uh, with uh, ad dropping and uh, activating communities, etc. So. Uh, of, that's that is a lot of things that is coming basically. <laughs> Perfect. And as um as Bruce mentioned, uh, stay tuned. Uh, we'll announce a few new joiners this month, and uh, there will be a lot more to come in this quarter. 
So with that, that concludes our third quarter um, AMA. Uh, thank you for uh, joining. I will post this video on our channel and stay tuned on our channel and see you next month. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Peace.